Okay, we're recording. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is the uh, Finance Committee of the Town Council um, uh, calling the meeting to order. Um, we're holding this meeting remotely by Zoom uh, per uh, various um, actions by the legislature. And uh, if you are uh, able to, or if you want to make a public comment, please raise your hand and we will bring you into the room to give a public comment. Um, if you're having trouble connecting, please uh, contact us and we'll see what we can do to, to get you on board. Um, one thing, the first thing I have to do is check to see whether we have, we certainly have a quorum, see whether the uh, members of the committee uh, can be here, can hear me and can be heard. So I'll just go in order of the people on my screen. Uh, uh, Councillor Haneke? Present. Andy? Present. Kathy? Here. Bernie? Present. Okay, we don't have Alicia or Matt with us at the moment. Um, so I'll, uh, but we do have a quorum. So uh, let me see if there's anyone that wants to make a public comment. Um, uh, this is the accounting department. <laughs> um, go ahead, bring bring them in, please. <laughs> I'm I'm promoting them to panelists. Mm -hmm. You all should have individual <laughs> um, invitation links, just so you know. <laughs> okay. And it looks like a new person has joined. So Bob, you might want to um, yep. repeat that it's public comment. Yeah. It, yes. So, so uh, we'll have a public comment here this time. Uh, if anyone in the audience wants wishes to make a public comment, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, yeah. Can you bring Tony in, please? Hi, thank you. I joined five minutes late at the last meeting and missed public comment. <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> right at the very beginning. Um, just encouraging you to support the 6% for the regional school budget and in identifying where the money could come from, I would encourage you to look at the extra half a percent that is being given to the capital budget. Um, if ARPA money is tapped, the two and a half million earmarked for the bank center would be a good place to look. Um, the solar panels, as Kathy and Mandy Joe explained at the last meeting, are a great investment. So I, I think that would be a poor choice of where to get the funding. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see, uh, no, uh, George, did you wanna make a comment? If you do so, uh, raise your hand, please. All right. So I think that does it for public comment. Um, so let's move on to our the main part of our uh, agenda today. We want to review um, the conservation, sustainability, planning, and inspections uh, primarily. Um, then we'll have a discussion of the regional public schools. And uh, I don't know if that we'll not going to do much of a review of the draft report because it's still pretty draft uh, and it's not complete. Uh, so um, I will, uh, but we'll, let's, let's talk about how we can finish it off uh, at the end of uh, the meeting. So um, why don't we bring on uh, conservation? Uh, Dave, I think you're, you're on. Um, yeah. So uh, there were a, a bunch of, comments in there that we got uh, answers to. Um, and uh, I think that, uh, is there something well, you wanted to say? Sure, I, I typically, if it's okay with you, I typically give a very brief, I know we're short on time, but I give a very brief overview of just kind of the functional area because we are, you know, kind of a working unit of the town um, and I can be two minutes if that's okay with you. Sure. Um, so thanks everybody for having us this morning. I'm joined by Rob, Christine and Stephanie, the department heads in uh, conservation and development. Uh, I think you all for the most part know us quite well. Uh, the, you know, uh, within this functional area are the departments of conservation, planning, sustainability, um, uh, sustain sustainability now is its own standalone department and inspection services. Um, 
although it's not on the org chart, I would suggest that facilities is also very much a part of this uh, this functional area. We work very closely and, and are, are situated here in town hall with Jeremiah LaPlante, our facilities manager. You know, our focus overall is on community development. We follow very closely the master plan, a number of other town plans that have been adopted by various boards and committees, uh, including the master plan, open space and recreation plan, and many others. Um, this is a really cohesive working group. Um, it's really one of the, 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 the kind of joys of my life working with the people. We have about 24 full and part-time people and uh, staff in this functional area. They're very dedicated, work long hours, nights, weekends, um, uh, it's really a pleasure to work with everybody here and particularly the department heads, but, you know, we're only as good as the people that work with us and for us. And, um, you know, I'm very proud to, to be working for, for, and with them, uh, every day to make the community a better place. We also work very closely with DPW, recreation, health, many, many other departments, and of course, community groups and also the colleges. Um, broad range of projects and initiatives. I'm not going to steal anybody's thunder, but, um, you know, we work on zoning, sustainability, market rate housing, affordable housing, sheltering, you know, the VFW project down the street from town hall is a very big and very important project for the community. And we're leading the way on that, uh, park and common planning. We've got the, uh, incredible work being done on the, on the North common right in front of town hall. That's 11 years in the making. Uh, Chris Brestrup and Nate Malloy and myself and with assistance from DPW 11 years ago started that project and it's really exciting to see that coming to fruition. Safe and healthy neighborhoods, safe and healthy rentals are all part of our portfolio and I would suggest that, uh, you know, 75 to 80 percent of the grants that the town seeks and receives come through this functional area. So, it's a really dynamic group. It's a wonderful group, and we're happy to be here with you this morning. Um, transitioning here quickly, Bob, to conservation. Uh, the focus areas for last year and for the, the coming year really fall into a couple of different categories. Happy to take your questions if there are additional questions beyond what we answered. Um, we're really focusing uh, on kind of taking care of what we have. That's really a, a uh, a, a real priority for the conservation department, taking care of all the trails. We have 80 miles of trails and my, my focus with getting grants, seeking CPA funding over the last couple of years has been really about restoring and enhancing what we have. You've seen uh, more parking areas going up, ADA access is a big focus and repairing and replacing old 30, 20 to 30 year old bridges, a uh, really big focus. We're working with the Conservation Commission on a land use committee, and this group is focused on how do we manage our over 2,000 acres of conservation land now and in the future, particularly with a focus on global climate change. Those lands will be changing. The biota, the, the animals and the plants and the trees will be changing. Um, that's a given over the next 20 to 30 years. How do we manage those lands for people and for wildlife? Uh, Puffer's Pond continues to be a big focus. I noted in some of my comments for the budget document that we um, submitted a $400,000 grant to repair the, the dike and the dam at Puffer's Pond. So that's got to be a priority, both from a, a clearly a public safety standpoint, but also a recreation, a passive recreation standpoint. We oversee community gardens in two, two locations, Amethyst Brook and Fort River. Uh, we've got somewhere on the order of 65 uh, individuals and families using those community gardens. So conservation staff focus on that, those. And lastly, of course, Hickory Ridge is a big focus moving forward. Uh, we're really um, proud to be part of that project. And I did answer some of those questions that were posed to me on that. So I think with that, I'll stop on conservation and turn it over to you, Bob, and any questions that the committee might have. Uh, Bob, can we quickly confirm Alicia can hear and be heard? Yeah, I was going to do that. Uh, Alicia? Yes, thank you. Okay, did did you have any other questions, uh, Councilor Walker? Um, not yet, thank you. Okay. Um, so the one question I have is, or maybe it's it's more of a, a concern, and it, it's, it's 
Um, it seems to be very difficult for businesses to get started in, in Amherst. And I, I spoke with one person who has a business here in Amherst and a, a, an office in, um, in Northampton. And this person said it was like pulling teeth to get uh, get started in Amherst, but it was a, a piece of cake to get started in, in Northampton. So I'm wondering if there's, you know, you know, you notice that, or you noted that um, some projects are, 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 they're complex because of uh, the development or the, the areas that are open to development uh, are also regulated heavily by other departments and uh, which makes it more difficult. Uh, but can you kind of give an overview of this and, and what we're doing to try to make it uh, easier for people to, to, to um, develop or to open businesses? Sure, I think if you don't mind, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look to Rob and uh, Christine to jump in on this um, because they were the ones who answered th those specific questions having to do with with business development in town. Okay, Rob. Thank you. Um, I did try to answer this question in the uh, the document that was sent around. So I'll just summarize that. You know, um, the, in the past twelve years that I've been here, you know, we've made some some pretty good progress on trying to, uh, you know, be more available and help uh, applicants uh, work their way through a complicated process. Um, before I get into that, I will I will mention that we often look to Northampton uh, and have often discussed uh, when we're uh, proposing bylaw amendments, uh, you know, that many of the uses, the non-residential uses in Northampton in their zoning bylaw are simply yes, you know, where we don't have, we have a lot of special permits and, you know, we're, we're kind of picking away at that. Uh, with bylaw amendments to to um, reduce the number of special permits that are needed, uh, which is a uh, costly and lengthy process. Uh, so we're trying to, um, you know, keep that process available and intact for the uses that really uh, should be subject to it. Uh, but we uh, many years ago created a position uh, of the permit administrator in this office, and uh, that position is held by Jen Mullins currently, and uh, she does a lot of work with uh, being the first point of contact for, for applicants and stays in touch with, with the applicant throughout the process, regularly checks in, uh, which is nice. I'll talk a little bit about our open gov system that's now in place, but with our permit tracking and kind of project tracking system, uh, I often see uh, the communication that's going on and, and regularly it's just a, you know, an, an, a question or a, uh, you know, communication with a applicant to say, Hey, what's going on? You know, we, you know, we've met, we've talked about your new restaurant. Uh, you started the process, but you know, there's more to do. And, and there's a lot of that type of communication going on, which has uh, been really helpful. Uh, all of our staff meets uh, regularly with other departments. There's, there's very good communication between fire, public works, um, all of our inspectors, the, the public health department and others to uh, make sure everyone's aware of the issues, the, the status of projects and what, you know, what needs to be done in, in, in uh, an effort to make sure the applicant is advised properly on, on what's, what they need to um, complete in order to get their project either uh, started or finished. Um, we are, like I said, often uh, recommending bylaw changes, uh, you know, and and adding to the list of priorities. Uh, some of them move ahead, some of them don't. Uh, you know, we've had really good luck with uh, the food establishment amendment that happened uh, uh, recently where restaurants can be permitted with administrative approval rather than going through the special permit process. So we've seen a lot of activity there. When we get to my, uh, you know, my budget, I'll talk about a little bit about numbers on things that have happened in that area. Uh, you know, we, we reach out and stay in touch with the uh, directors at the bid in the chamber. Uh, we recently uh, held uh, a meeting with the uh, the Black Business Association of Amherst, uh, just to talk about, you know, what process looks like here. Um, this, you know, isn't something that we created, something that we're handed with the zoning bylaws, and we try to uh, make sure everyone's aware that there are steps that, you know, the applicant needs to go through. And, 
and really look out for things that might be concerning to an applicant for their particular idea before they sign into a lease and, uh, you know, find out maybe the, the challenges of, of a particular space. Uh, so we're, we're recommending to all the groups that, you know, they, they direct people our way first before they get, get that far along. Um, we are often always, Christine and I in particular, having meetings with potential app applicants, prospective business owners, uh, whether it's somebody with, uh, you know, more than one establishment somewhere in other communities, our communities, or somebody's first uh, first attempt at, at uh, opening their own business. And, uh, you know, we sit with them, we bring in uh, whoever needs to be brought into the process, and they're, they're given a lot of information. It's, it's can be really uh, uh, overwhelming. It can be a, a ton of steps that need to be followed. Uh, and oftentimes, you know, we suggest either breaking it into pieces and, and, and you know, depending on the response we get, uh, a, a timeline on how to best approach that. So our goal is to make sure that, you know, any application that comes into this office for a land use permit is in its best condition that it can be most and, and has the best chances of being approved. So we work really hard at completing, making sure applications are complete. We, we tend to know, um, what the boards like to see, what they focus on, what uh, their areas of interest are. Uh, and, and that changes as board members change. So we, we adapt to that and, and we work with applicants to really try to get their, their project in the best condition when being considered and you know hope for approval, hope for uh, maybe even in, in one uh, session so that the time doesn't drag on. Um, as far as building permits go, I think that might have been part of one of the questions. Uh, you know, these are reviewed really quickly. I mean, uh, quicker than most communities uh, that I'm aware of. Uh, generally, building permits are reviewed in three, four days max, uh, never more than 10 days uh, it, when, when times are really busy or it's a more complicated project. But there's, um, you know, very... Uh, very rapid response to a building permit application that's submitted and even more so now with with the use of OpenGov. Uh, so I'll finish with OpenGov. OpenGov has been a great tool. Uh, we're probably just over a year of using it for uh, most of our building and trade permits, uh, licensing, uh, most recently rental permitting and uh, food establishment licenses. And uh, not only is it easy to use, it's, you know, a way a, a, a contractor or applicant can submit an application over the weekend, late at night when, when they're not working uh, and have time to, to focus on that. They can ask questions any time of the day and, you know, know that uh, somebody from staff is going to see it in their workflow the next business day. Uh, and uh, our staff is very responsive to the questions that that come there. It's a place to, to uh, put all of the documents uh, associated with the project, so they're easy to find, both by the applicant. Maybe the owner uh, has access and, and is given, uh, you know, part of the contact uh, information so that they can see what's going on and know that their project is proceeding. Uh, and that that falls through all the way through to completion and certificate of occupancy, right up to the very final stages of the project. So we're seeing that to be used more and more and the benefits of it and we'll uh, we'll continue to encourage uh, use of that um, i did note that you know other than bring you know bringing in more of the permitting process into OpenGov, so we don't uh we don't currently use it for any of our land use permitting uh you know i know that we need to make a significant change and update to our website to make it uh easier to find information have more information available um, and, you know, that's something that we hope to, um, you know, be able to accomplish with, uh, with assistance from um, other departments in particular, IT is needed for that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Councilor Haneke, questions? Yeah, no, I, I thank everyone for the um, written responses. And so I'm going to focus on some questions or some concerns I have with those written responses as it relates to the budget. Um, I I was struck by the written responses about um, a, a question I asked of um, for the planning department of what are the goals and plans for feedback on the initiatives during a development phase um, for particular things. And I mentioned, you know, um, because, you know, all of those things in some sense relate to the goals, the manager's goals of economic development and all, but the council itself is a key stakeholder because they're your 13 votes 
you need nine of us to vote for it. And it seems like the plan is to say, we're not going to talk to the council until we've got a, a final project that we're ready to go to public hearing for. Um, and I'm curious what the thought process is on that when wouldn't it be more efficient to figure out where the council is on these projects we're paying consultants for or spending a lot of staff resources on to ensure that they have a chance of success at the council? Because if you're working a lot or you're going through that and you're never talking to a significant number of counselors and then you come to the council and you've spent all this money and the council says, you know, we don't like that direction. Wasn't that a waste of time when it's the council's votes you need? Um, so I'd like you to, to respond a little bit more to some of that, of, of the impression that it gave of waiting till the very end to talk to the people whose votes you need. Um, and then the other impression I got from reading all of the responses was potentially that the inspections department and the planning department might be slightly at odds on how and where to go about, um, this goes directly back to Councillor Hegner's question, go about making and reducing those barriers. Um, the inspections, Building Inspector Mora just talked about needing zoning changes, that he's doing a lot on the once you've applied to try and make it go as smooth as possible, but the zoning is a lot of the complication. Um, yet the planning department's response seemed to be um, that improving economic, you know, that by providing more places for people to live, work, and shop um, could improve economic opportunities and, and all of this barriers. But, um, you know, and you, you could extrapolate by the creating improved places for living, working, and shopping will re result in reducing barriers to economic development without really talking about the barrier of the complication of the zoning bylaw. So I, I read these answers as potentially the two departments are in conflict about how we reduce barriers to economic development. So I'd really like to hear from our planning department on that issue. Cause I think Rob really discussed his thoughts on it already. May I yes. respond? Um, so I don't think we're in conflict. We work very closely together on all the projects and we do see and discover um, flaws in our zoning bylaw that we intend to address, but um, I really don't think the zoning bylaw is, you know, necessarily at fault for some of the issues that we have with regard to economic development. Um, you know, I think that we are always interested in helping people to start their businesses and we do make every effort to meet with them. And, you know, uh, the minute we find out that somebody is interested in opening a business, we, um, you know, try to set up a meeting with them and, and help them along with the process. So I don't really think that there's a conflict between what inspection services does and what planning does. Um, there are uh, I think just by the nature of Amherst, um, various things that were set in place years ago that require um, special permits, and we have um, eliminated some of those for food and drink establishments and other things, and ADUs for one thing, accessory dwelling units. Um, so it makes it easier to do those things. Um, it, it is challenging at this time. We've been shorthanded in the planning department uh, since I think November of 2022. We've been down a, a person ever since then. So to take on um, things that are, you know, going to be um, beneficial to the town um, is challenging. You know, we have all of our regular permitting to do and the projects that we're working on, such as um, downtown design guidelines and other projects. So, you know, we, we're just like lacking a fourth wheel, if you want to talk about it that way. And, um, you know, I think we have taken on um, zoning amendments in the past and we've been successful. There was one year a few years ago where we had 11 zoning amendments that went through. But, you know, recently we've had a hard time to um, initiate projects. We also have a lot of projects that are related to uh, grant funding that we have um, gotten. And so we have to work on those. So we have to kind of balance things out. So 
I agree that there are changes that we could make in our zoning bylaw that would probably make it easier to develop um, land and to uh, open businesses, but we just haven't had the bandwidth recently to attack those in the last, say, year and a half. What was the other part of your question? Um, bringing town council into the process of developing projects. So uh, it is not typical for us to reach out to town council to um, involve members in projects. We certainly um, appreciate when town council members attend our meetings and uh, you know make comments and um, are uh, you know speak as residents, but there isn't a process in place for us to um, necessarily interact with the town council as a whole on all of these projects. If town council would like us to make presentations, we're always available to do that. And if town council would like to reach out to us through the town manager to say, hey, can you come and talk to us about our downtown design guidelines project? We'd be happy to do that and tell you about the, you know, the status of that project and other things as well. So um, I, since there isn't a formal uh, way of involving town council along the way, we're, we do our best to reach out and make sure that everybody knows when meetings are occurring and that there are opportunities to participate in um, stakeholder groups and things like that. One of your members did participate as a resident stakeholder in the early stages of the uh, downtown design guidelines. So um, yeah, so we're we're always open to meeting but we, of course, we have to go through the town manager. And if you would like us to come and give you a report on any of these projects, we'd be happy to do that. Um, does that answer your question? I, I guess I would like to follow up with um, how does one counselor become a stakeholder in a resident group and other counselors not invited to become those same stakeholders, number one. But number two, um, I've as, as a member of CRC, I've specifically asked for CRC to be involved through our Chair, um, I don't know whether you were at the meetings when we got to those things, and I haven't seen any follow up with that. So I will continue to follow up with the CRC chair because that's the committee it involves with. But I'm, I guess I'm still confused how that happens. It's not totally budget related, so I don't want to get too okay. far into it. But it is, you know, the council asked for through the budget process, the Dodson and Flinker design guidelines, we sort of drove funding that, yet we don't seem to be involved in it. And I find that very strange as a budget related item, but we can talk later. Okay. And as far as um, having a counselor involved in the stakeholder group, uh, that counselor reached out to us and asked to be involved in the stakeholder group because that counselor lives in the downtown area. Um, any other of the council members could have you know, requested to be involved in those in that group or those groups, um, but I didn't hear from anybody else. Um, there is a little challenge for us to be in communication with counselors given guidelines that we've been given by the town manager about um, communication. And so I think, you know, in general, we communicate with the town manager in order to get to town council members. So, um, town council may want to talk to the town manager about how to make that more of a transparent, you know, fluid process. And I'd be open to that. Um, so, and, and I did not know that CRC was interested in um, being involved in the downtown standards um, project. And so if that is true, I'd be happy to work with CRC on that. So that was something that I wasn't aware of. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Walker. Um, thank you, Bob. So most of my questions were just answered, but I just had a couple of like clarifying points related to um, economic development. Um, and I think one of them was about um, the process question. And I think Mandy Joe already asked part of that question, but the second piece that I was wondering is, and Christine, I think you briefly touched on this. So maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on if the issues with the process are mostly zoning issues. I said, I think you said that they were not. And so what are some other common issues that businesses face? Um, because I'm thinking in terms of what areas 
we can look at in terms of simplifying the process for business um, owners? Um, may I respond? Um, so I think that business owners often aren't aware of the kinds of things that they need to do in order to get permits. Um, things like, um, you know, sometimes hiring a surveyor to survey the property, and that costs a few thousand dollars, or getting an architect in to do, um, you know, existing conditions of a building or of a property, and um, then having, you know, professional advice through an architect or through a mechanical engineer or whatever to help them to um, develop their ideas and make it possible to build what they need to build in order to get permitted. So um, that's what I mean by it's not all zoning. It's, you know, the fact that they need to get permits, a lot of times they aren't aware of all the permits that they need to get. And then they're not aware that they need to have consulting help to help them get those permits. They can't just sketch something on a piece of paper and bring it into us. They have to show us what is this thing going to look like? What is it going to, you know, how is it going to be designed? And um, you know, the boards and committees, particularly the planning board and the zoning board of appeals have, you know, fairly high expectations about what kinds of materials are brought to them um, in order for them to permit a project. So we help the applicant to understand what it is that they need to submit in order to get a permit. And some applicants are you know, maybe more naive than others, and some are more sophisticated than others. So different applicants respond to that information and that those requirements in different ways. And we do try to, you know, sit down and meet with them and help them as much as we can. And that's, that's how I would respond to that. Okay, thank you. And this is <clears throat> a comment that might not necessarily be for you specifically, but I think this might be something important to see if we can have a collaboration with our DEI department on um, in terms of figuring out how we can provide educational resources um, in the name of bringing in diverse businesses um, into the town. And maybe that's something that we can collab, like you two across departments can collab on in the future. Mm -hmm. I think I'd be interested to see sure. something like that. That would be very good. Yep. I'd appreciate that too. Okay. Thank you. Um, Kathy? So I, I hope it's okay with you all if we skip around because you provided us with terrific written responses. So um, I have, I think I'll start with Stephanie because we haven't heard her voice yet. Um, <laughs> and and uh, we're thrilled with the work you do, Stephanie. So I was the one who noticed how many meetings you attend in your one person department um, and your plea for support staff, which clearly is not in this budget. So I wanted some sense if there's any way we can streamline. And I know your response was some of these are meetings you have to go to because they're part of getting a grant or, or working with groups. And I know you staff ECAC. So it's on the time, time in meeting side. And then um, the extent to which as you're conceptualizing a grant, are you alone in writing the grant or do you have support? Because my my feeling is there's multiple new opportunities in the conservation sustainability area and that not only do you have to apply for the grant, but then you have to administer it or, or think. So it, it's trying to get some sense of, uh, are you working overtime every day? <laughs> you know, are you at a really high stress level or is this kind of manageable, um, but is there anything that more teamwork from existing team could help out on? So um, as you noted, the positions that were requested were not part of this budget, which, and I just understand, I think I've been here a very long time. I understand we have the resources that we have and they're not always gonna be available. So um, I think, also because of my longevity with the town, I've also found a way to manage my work in a way that is sustainable for myself personally. Um, but yes, I think I will be getting more support from uh, planning staff. Unfortunately, uh, the, the new planner who has just come on board 
was identified as having at least 20% of their time to work with me. Unfortunately, because the planning department is not fully staffed, I think that person really needs to focus on supporting the work of the planning department. And until that happens, I won't get that additional support. Um, likewise, uh, some administrative support was uh, identified coming from the, um, the inspections department, uh, from the front staff and unfortunately I think they too are also down right now so I can't really rely on that particular support. I will say what's changed over the years is that some of the work that I do and this is great is becoming embedded within how the town operates and looks at sustainability. So for instance when the capital project requests are made, they have to identify how this contributes to sustainability. So there are things that are beginning to happen without my needing to influence or support or direct or provide the resources for those things to happen. Um, so for instance, I would say like, you know, the police department looking at hybrid vehicles or the fire department wanting to purchase um, equipment and add anti-idling uh, technology onto it. Those kinds of things that are kind of happening on their own uh, now reduce the amount of work that I have to do in that arena. So I will say in terms of stress level, sometimes it's more stressful than others. I, I think what has to be understood is that we cannot pursue every single grant funding opportunity that comes along. And even something that seems like a great idea may not be. I will give an example of um, EV infrastructure and charging equipment. The town already has seven charging dual heads charging stations in town. We're getting two level three chargers that will have four ports available that will be behind the um, what's called the C CVS lot, but it's the, the public lot. So those opportunities um, already exist to some degree, more so than other communities. I have an EV, so looking at finding those locations across you know, certain corridors we're actually doing pretty well. Um, also, doing more of that requires more infrastructure access that we don't necessarily have. So I'm I'm not looking at every grant as in, oh, we have to do this just because it's here right now. I'm looking at what have we done? We're in pretty decent shape there. Maybe we can't do this at this time. So I'm assessing what is the bigger need. And also the things that we do at the municipal level, we're doing okay. Uh, addressing our municipal operations and reducing our carbon emissions. Um, we've been consistently reducing our, um, our emissions by 20% uh, according to the green communities goals that we set. So the last three years we've met that goal, which is fantastic. Um, what we really need to do more broadly is work on the community sector and the residential sector, which we don't have direct influence over. Um, however, having things like the community choice aggregation coming on board is gonna give us more of that opportunity. So looking at those kinds of projects that reach out to the community more broadly are the kinds of things that I tend to try to focus on more. Um, and I'd say, you know, I can do what I can do. <laughs> so um, I don't know if that answers your question. No, it, it does. And and thank you for the example. And I just a quick follow up. I have two more, Bob, if I can do them from different topics. But on the EV charging infrastructure, if we're purchasing it now or even in the pipeline in uh, 2023, there's a federal direct credit rebate for those. So I, I don't know to the extent the finance department is saying, oh, this one is eligible, um, you know, and packaging it up. So it's just a, I don't know, but it would be good to look at that. Um, yeah, we have, yeah, well, we have grant, fund for all of the EV charging that we've installed, it's all been through grant funding. It's all been grant anyway. And not, we haven't, I think the most we've had to pay out of pocket has been $3,000 and there's going to be $3,000 more for this next, the level three chargers, but that's the most out of all of the charging infrastructure that we've done. It's all been grant supported. Bob, can I ask the two others? Do you want to go to, because one is um, in inspections. So it's, it's, I'm jumping into another topic. Could, could you wait? Cause I've got uh, Dave sure. and Bernie would sure, like to sure. comment. I can wait. So. I'll, I'll come back to me. Okay. Dave, did you want to comment or respond to something? 
I think I think Bernie's hand was up before me, Bob. So okay. I'm happy to wait for him. Okay, Bernie. Thank you, Dave. Um, thank you, Bob. My, I guess I jotted this down while we were talking about planning, but it, it applies more broadly, I think. Um, <clears throat> what are folks finding as constraints to hiring? Um, you, you know, it seems to me that we've got um, key positions that just can't get filled or don't get filled. Uh, we tend to lose positions to uh, private sector. So I'm wondering what we might do to uh, uh, where people are seeing some constraints around around hiring. And I was also thinking that um, would it be possible uh, if we had an internship program, so in planning, uh, so we have a talented person who comes in as an intern, uh, works as an intern uh, for a while, for a year or two, and then when they graduate, uh, they can move into a, uh, move into a position. Um, I, I know we don't do succession planning well. <laughs> uh, that's a fact. So, um, just a general general kind of comment on um, our our inability to 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 fill those positions. I also want to editorialize for half a minute here in, in terms of uh, uh, I'm one of those people that thinks uh, simple is better. And uh, I've had uh, uh, in the past, way past, I've had a uh, wild experience with the uh, building department, which I believe won't happen anymore because of uh, the technology and the administrative changes um, that uh, that's come about. With, uh, this is pre-Rob, by the way, my, my experience. Uh, so I think things have gotten better. I also want to make the observation that uh, there are 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts, and everybody does something a little bit differently. So if the expectation in the area is I'm going to walk in with a pencil drawing and Amherst is going to approve it, um, that's that shouldn't be. <laughs> okay, so if we could go back to the question of, uh, of, of uh, hiring. Thank you. Do you want me to answer that? Sure. Sure. Um... I think it's a number of things. I think one of the things is that there are very high expectations here of the people in the planning department. They have long hours that they work. They attend night meetings. They're often asked to staff multiple um, boards and committees. Um, there's a very high expectation for the type of written material that comes out of our department and making sure that everything is really accurate. We have a good record of not having our um, decisions that are made by the Zoning Board of Appeals or the Planning Board appealed. Um, so we stay out of uh, court um, pretty well. Um, maybe I should knock on wood when I say that. Um, we do have some fairly complicated projects such as the comprehensive uh, or chapter 40B projects that we put through and we want to make sure that those are handled really well because the town supports affordable housing. So we're constantly working, we're working on deadlines, we're working on accuracy, we're working on just trying to get things out the door and that um, is kind of overwhelming. It's overwhelming for the people who work in this department. Um, the pressure is overwhelming. The amount of work is overwhelming. The, um, how can I say this in a charming manner, but the scrutiny by the public and the criticism by the public and the constant input from the public and trying to get that input onto um, the place where it should go, which would be the zoning board or the planning board. So we're constantly, you know, we're being the mediator among all these different groups. And we are also accepting a lot of criticism and, um, you know, negative comments. So I think it makes it, um, you know, some, some people are overwhelmed, some people are disheartened, some people are just, you know, kind of um, feeling like they never catch up, they never achieve what they want to achieve. So that's a feeling of not being successful. So I think somehow we have to make um, work in the planning department more, um, more of a, you know, a professional um, situation where people aren't always feeling um, overwhelmed and incompetent. And the other thing is that um, the recent, um, and this didn't affect people farther back than a few months ago, but the recent salary study that uh, was produced um, put the planning positions at a very, I shouldn't say very, because it 
uh, people will compare them with <laughs> themselves. But anyway, at a, at a low lower level than they should be. The planning staff um, usually has master's degrees. I, I can't think of any situation. Oh, yeah, there were uh, there was one a few years ago who didn't have a master's degree, but they usually have master's degree in, degrees in planning. Um, they spent a long time in school. They have a lot of experience. And they're not um, recognized at the professional level that they should be recognized at in terms of rank on the org chart. And um, the salaries aren't that bad comparing them with other uh, towns. But I think that the status of the position is not there. So it's really uh, overwork, stress, um, lack of recognition. Um, and then somebody sees another job in another location. We lost one person to the Massachusetts Department of Transportation. We lost somebody to Montague. We recently lost somebody to East Longmeadow. So, um, you know, they're more the, the shiny object or the grass is greener or whatever is going on here. Um, but, you know, I think we should make an attempt to make working in the planning department a little more manageable and, um, you know, life enhancing. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I, yeah, I can under, you know, I, I, I can certainly understand that. Um, so, uh, again, I think we need to take all this very seriously and uh, uh, look to see how we can better, more effectively hire people and maybe uh, not just to staff up to what we have, but maybe staff beyond what we have. Given the roles that people play and given the complications, and I've wholeheartedly agree that uh, the uh, the level of, of of criticism that gets along at planning department and other town employees is uh, uh, in Amherst is excessive based on my experience in other communities. Okay, thanks. Uh, Dave, did you wanna jump in here? Thanks, Bob. I we we've kind of gone all all over the place here with with lots of good questions and comments. I don't want to belabor some of these these staffing issues or, or questions about staffing. I mean, clearly staffing town wide and and region wide and frankly in the country is has been challenging since the pandemic and will continue to be challenging. Um, I think Chris and and Stephanie and others have made good points here. Um, um, but I, I don't want to take all of our time if if we could on staffing. I know that each one of the department heads also wanted to say a little bit more about what they're doing um, for projects. Again, it's it's um, it's the finance committee's agenda. So I didn't know if you wanted to go back to the departments or um, or just continue with the round robin questions. We're happy to do either. Well, I you know I think. Um... We we can as long as the, it's brief. I don't I don't want to belabor the the um, the discussion of of what we do because um, we're trying to focus on on the budget and on you know how to how to you know whether we should approve that uh, or recommend that the council approve it or not. So um, I think people know pretty much what what is done, but I mean we can. I, I'm I'm open to uh, brief presentations. Uh, or discussions of of what you know the key things that uh, each department does, and we're happy to take other questions. You know that 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 people want to throw at us with regard to follow up on the on the written um, piece. The other thing I want to say, Stephanie made a good point about sustainability, and I think I think it holds true with the planners as well that there are now we've moved in a good direction in terms of sustainability that we now have. Stephanie has seeded ideas, processes, concepts, uh, grants throughout the organization. So as much as Stephanie is the pivot point, she is the, the, the sustainability director. Many other people now are working, parts of their jobs are working on sustainability. Um, you know, part of, of, of Dave Zomack, part of Rob Mora, part of uh, uh, Jeremiah LaPlante. Jeremiah is our, our facilities director is working closely with Stephanie on a number of sustainability related uh, initiatives, but you don't see that in the sustainability budget. So I think we're moving in, a, in the right direction without question. 
the other thing I just wanted to say back to something Mandy said about kind of zoning and and I think um, um, I think you made raise some very good points. I don't think we're we the town hasn't quite figured out. You know, we've been through a number of zoning uh, initiatives, zoning changes over the past three to five years. I think we have a lot left to do there. What is the interface between the town council, the town council's committees, uh, committees and uh, planning initiatives, both projects and zoning initiatives? Um, I go back to the town manager's goals as they're articulated uh, by the town council. And I think we're still, we, all of us are still feeling our way through that. Um, what is the feedback loop from the, the council goals to the manager, the manager, then those goals translating to staff and then those working their way back to the council in terms of grants and projects and initiatives. I, th I think that's a, that's a work in progress. And I don't think any of us think that's a perfect process. And I think it's fair that, that we all look at that consistently and periodically to say, is it working or are there ways we can improve it? So I think that's open to improvement um, at all levels. Kathy, you wanted to raise some additional issues, so. Yeah, focused on budget. Um, <laughs> so so I, I just have, bought, Rob, they're both in your area. Um, the first one is, you noted in the budget book that you're now responsible, and I put this in a question, but I just want to follow it up a little bit more, that if um, a resident's uh, a property has brush or debris overhanging a sidewalk, you're now the place to go to, to give them a notice, they better do something about it or clean it up. I asked whether um, this would also apply to UMass own properties? In in other words, would they have to respond or there is a penalty fee and, and, and large apartment buildings? And I'm, I'm using only one road as an example, but um, if you go up um, North Pleasant on one side of it, uh, some of it is, I don't think the residential uh, responsibility, but tree roots growing into the sidewalk that have severed it, um, but brushes coming out so that people avoid the sidewalk and go into the street. So the question is, is that working? And is there a way we can let people know that they can go in and then get action? Or should, do you need help from residents to alert the property owner <laughs> That they better get their act, you know. So it's it's like, how can um, we make this work? We put this new piece, and you said DPW used to worry about sidewalks. So that's question number one. And then the only expansion of staff in our budget is, in theory, finance with fees, and that's the expansion for the rental uh, inspection bylaw. Um, and so I'm. Is there a plan like within a year or within two years to say, are we actually budget neutral on it? Here's the revenues, here's the expenses. And then is there any kind of thought of, we didn't put a sunset clause in it, but uh, is this working kind of an assessment for a regular report? So is it achieving what we hoped it would achieve? Is it budget neutral? So just a future thinking on budget impact because it, it jumps out at you as, we didn't increase sustainability staff. We didn't include, but we increased inspectors. So those two questions, sidewalks and inspectors. Okay. Uh, yeah. So sidewalks are still a little new to us. Uh, you know, it's been several months since it was handed over to us. Uh, we don't get an awful lot of complaints, uh, you know, outside of the, the, the snow seasons, uh, and we haven't seen a lot of snow. So, you know, we're still learning a little bit about that. Um, I would have absolutely no hesitation contacting the university if they have a sidewalk that, you know, breaches the sidewalks of private property owners, such as North Pleasant Street. Um, I think ultimately they can, you know, 
you know, claim immunity to our general bylaws. And, you know, we would deal with that if they ever chose to do that. I think any interactions I've had with them for items that fall under our regulations, they're very responsive and try to accommodate what needs to be done. So I don't really, I'm not really concerned about that, although I don't have any experience yet of dealing with a particular situation. We're not um, out looking for the problems ourselves. So they, it's really is only on complaint response. And most, you know, most of the public would uh, logically think to call public works first. Uh, and when that happens, the staff contacts us uh, and gives us the, takes the information, conveys it to us, and then we follow up and deal with it. Um, so that the person that made the call doesn't have to call another office and get bounced around. So we try to make, we, we've agreed, Guilford and I have agreed to try to do this as seamlessly as possible for the person making the call in this transition period that could go on for a year or two before, you know, maybe it's more widely known. Uh, the, the presence on the website is with Public Works, uh, you know, and that directs you to inspection services. What we want to do is add, uh, you know, a, a very obvious place on the website that will get us, you know, get us the uh, the complaint or the the report of the issue. Uh, we do often get them through our um, complaint online complaint process uh, that can be filed anytime. Uh, that that falls into our rental uh, residential rental permitting pages of the bylaw of the website. So. Uh, you'd have to know it's there or, you know, if it's associated with a rental property, it, it's a little easier to find. So we need to do some work there. And, and your question, do we need help? Yes. Uh, you know, any, you know, any, um, you know, suggestions, recommendations that counselors or, you know, other groups can get that information out there. Um, we do have a very large contact, email contact list of about 700 unique uh, users uh, that are mostly associated with residential rental properties, but they also are owners that are associated with other uh, non-residential properties uh, that we could send a message to. That's, you know, another option. We're using that for the upcoming bylaw changes uh, with rental permitting, uh, but definitely open to any ideas on how to get the, the message out there. Uh, once we do find out about it, uh, it's a very, you know, quick response. Um, it gets prioritized. Uh, and, you know, so far, you know, the, the response has been well received and, you know, the issues are taken care of for the, for the handful that we've dealt with over the past six months or so. Um, moving on to the, the rental permit staffing. Uh, to, to all your questions, the answer is absolutely that's what's going to happen. Uh, you know, we're going to, as we do with all of our programs, look at revenue collection and look for trends and look for issues or anything notable uh, so that we're prepared when we come into budget season or just so I can alert the finance uh, team of things that are happening. Um, I think, as I mentioned in my responses, I expect it to be pretty predictable once we get moving, and and that's how we presented uh, the uh, you know the program initially because uh, you know minus you know less than a hundred properties that you know maybe don't register or register late that we have to chase after the bulk of the the properties renew on time and uh, that's a pretty predictable uh, registration fee that'll be collected and then once we uh, work out our process for inspections, the same will happen there uh, once we have all the, the staff in place and the uh, schedule built out for the five-year cycle. Uh, I've talked a little bit about this during the adoption of the bylaw or during the, the creation of it, and I'm, and I'm talking about it now with various groups. So I've, you know, I've been having meetings with members of the Amherst Landlord Association and other landlords and just trying to prep them for the changes and talk about how um, you know, some of the questions and that are going to come up through the implementation, particularly with the inspections, how they could be useful, helpful, and, you know, useful to our understanding of uh, some of the things that they deal with and, and how they respond to things. So we've been talking a lot about that. And what I've been, you know, mentioning is that, you know, throughout this, my, my thought was always, let's go through this five-year cycle so that I can answer all the questions that we haven't been able to answer about what is the condition of rental properties in Amherst. And I think once we know that, um, you know, it makes it, it makes it more, um, you know, um, accomplishable to be able to look at problem properties and prioritize, you know, where the focus should be. 
And it's very likely that we, you know, we might, we might be able to recommend that this, this uh, ongoing inspection of all these properties is not necessary. Uh, you know, I'd like to look at a way to grade or score properties and maybe some of them come off the inspection list. Some of them, you know, have increased inspections, but you know, the, the number of properties that we've been into and have this information on, first of all, are all problems and they're pretty big problems, but it's a small number of properties, small number of units in town. And, and, you know, as I said, from the very beginning, the only way to be able to address this, if this is, and this is what the council's goals were, um, and particularly the CRC was to address how to how to ensure we have safe and healthy uh, residential units. The only way to really do that is to first get a look at them. Uh, so I, you know, I, I think those conversations have to happen, and you know, I, I expect to bring that information in the future. Thank you, Councilor Walker. <clears throat> um, thank you. This is just a quick question, and it's st also still about the. Um rental bylaw inspections and fees. And I think you partially answered this in the document, but just a little bit of an elaboration um, in terms of the question, we know that the staff will be financed by the fees. And then the question was, will there be an accounting system to track and assess? Um, and I was just wondering if that's going to be separate or if these, or if like the rental bylaw inspections is going to be a little bit more overlapping with like general inspections in terms of resources. I'm I'm envisioning at this point it's going to be pretty separate. It's it's such a large task for you know for the department to handle uh, that the staff that will be assigned to this work will be dedicated to it you know almost entirely. I think you know the the overlapping of resources comes with covering vacations and you know unforeseen situations or big building openings you know that are you know usually over a period of weeks. Um, so I, I think we have to do that. Um, I'm, I'm expecting that uh, the two inspectors that will be dedicated to uh, this program will be scheduled out for the year. You know, they're, they're going to have to complete five to 600 inspections and the follow up that goes along with that. Uh, we still want to maintain the uh, complaint response component that we've always done and be available for issues that are not routine, regular, sc regular scheduled inspections. Uh, and I don't think there's any way we would be able to do that without having staff dedicated to it. And the same goes for our uh, administrative support staff person that, that will be hiring. will have to, uh, you know, really be on top of uh, scheduling, rescheduling, uh, you know, documenting, reporting, uh, and, and, staying, you know, in communication and being the person in the office that can answer the phone when a question comes in while our inspectors are out. So uh, I think that's going to be um, the approach. Uh, there isn't any other staff here that would be available because of all of their uh, demands. Uh, they wouldn't be able to, to help out, you know, our, our general building inspectors that are out looking at buildings and schools and all the other things that are going on uh, will need to, you know, stay available for that. So I don't think there's any other overlap that would occur. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the committee? Okay, I think um, we can let you all go then. Um, thanks very much. Uh, it's been a good conversation. And uh, I think we've had a uh, number of uh, good questions raised and a number of really good uh, answers. <laughs> so, And the written responses were terrific. So thank you for taking the time on them. Thank you very much for having us. Have a great day. All right. Thank thanks. you. So um, the next thing on the, on the agenda is the Amherst Regional Public Schools. And... Um, I don't know if we have any additional information, but Andy, did you want to weigh in? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I think that it's important to start with the report of the uh, BCG meeting from yesterday. And uh, Mandy was there too, and so I'll uh, rely on her also to uh, contribute to the discussion, but um, I think that uh, basically what happened was 
that Sandy Pooler has spent a lot of time thinking about in analyzing uh, what is going on with the budget in future years and what is going to be the impact of various things that affect might affect that uh, budget projection. But the important thing to start with is to look at the long-range financial impact pages 48 and 49 of the um, budget book that we have and to look at the bottom of page 49 and uh, we have FY25 as proposed, which was with the 4% increase to schools in balance. But then uh, at 26, you'll notice a deficit of excess of 467,000, 27 in excess of 516,000, deficit projection for 28 and 704,000 and 29 in excess of 854,000. Andy, what are you reading from? I'm looking at the bottom of page 49 of the budget book. Yeah, it's, oh, okay, thank you. Thank it's, you. A, it's right there. Yeah, thank you. No, thank you. Very, and, very bottom of that chart. Yeah. And then what he uh, presented was an additional spreadsheet and we asked that it be sent to uh, the BCG after the meeting, and I, I have not received it, and I don't think uh, Mandy's indicating she hasn't received it either, and I didn't copy it all down, but what he Sandy was doing was to take various factors that would affect those budget numbers and how much um, it would increase it, and of course, one of them is the six percent, and uh, if we went to six percent, and the six percent became the budget, it automatically increases those deficits in a substantial way in each successive year. And then there were other factors to be concerned about that also had an effect on the future projections. So that uh, what my takeaway of it, and then I'm going to uh, try and uh, then see if Mandy has anything to add to this, since she is the other BCG member from the committee who was there, was that the uh, budget uh, process that we have has to start looking seriously at that budget deficit that's going to grow and is going to go greater um, if we go to 6%. And uh, that we try and look at uh, what our strategies are going to be going forward. And uh, we just, I, I think that there's some disappointments I have because I don't think, as, as often as I have said, the school budgets continue to increase greater than revenue increases and that that's not a tenable long-range plan. And we need to grab hold of that and take responsibility as a community. And the community is the towns that provide the revenue and the schools which are spending the revenue and figure out a long-term solution uh, and we can't delay this. We can't keep kicking it down the road, but we continue to do so. And that I was very disappointed, therefore, to read about the, in this morning's paper, about the result of the school committee meeting and the proposal that Irv Rhodes put forward that we create some kind of process that allows us to all work together because it belongs to the entire communities and uh, it can't it's not going to be solved by revenue everybody keeps talking about revenue and i think revenue can help a little bit um but we're not going to be able to raise enough revenue and i say that because of my years of working with, with the legislature and the financial side in addition to everything else so um 
I think that the, that was one takeaway is that we really need to uh, try and solve the problem for FY25, but really not delay on working on 26. And uh, the other thing that I think that as a committee we need to be talking about is um, what questions do we need to present um, to Paul and the administration about uh, the, the uh, executive side of government about the alternatives that we might consider um, if we're going to try and solve the 25 problem so that we can get on the 26. So that that's my uh, report on the uh, meeting and my takeaway. I don't know if um, Mandy has other views, so I'll stop. Council Hennicky. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I'll I'll briefly um, share my screenshots of the charts Andy was talking about um, that have not been um, shared, other than through a meeting, so that people can see what what was presented. And I can explain some of it. But I a after doing this, I, I had other comments I wanted to make. But I I would say the the one other thing that Andy didn't mention that that BCG essentially put on the table for further discussion was overrides, uh, levy overrides, um, and potentially starting serious discussions about asking the voters of Amherst um, for a property tax override. Um, so so the, this, this top chart that says current add 355, 3% growth retirement and 4% growth all relate to increases in expenses um, that he was talking about and what that might do based on the projected revenues um, in the chart that's in the budget book that, that Andy referred to. So the current is the chart that's in the budget book. Sorry, I can't move the plus. That's where it was when I took the screenshot. <laughs> that's where Sandy's <laughs> cursor was. The add 355 to the region, is an, it, it says that if we add it to the budget and it becomes the base for the next years, what would change between the current chart and that new essentially a new chart and what the deficits would be between revenue and expenses. 3% growth, the chart in the budget book projects 2.5% growth across all four functional areas through FY29. If you change that from 25 to 3, what does the deficit look like? Retirement 10% in FY26 is, is an acknowledgement that we don't know because our retirement levy or costs expenses stayed basically even this year. Um, the chart in the budget book projects projects it out at a growth of five, approximately 5% 5 a year, um, every year. And this that that line says, well, what would it be if next year we kind of have to make, if the state says we're at 10% next year because we were basically flat this year. Um, in other words, making up those two years instead of one. And 4% growth is the same thing as the 3% growth, but at, at a 4% level. Um, Andy had asked during BCG, what about the uh, Municipal Empowerment Act and any of the local revenues, uh, local option taxes that are proposed to be changes? What what kind of increase would that show to the revenues? Um, and the bottom chart here that says increase in motor vehicle excise by 5%, hotel up 1%, meals to 1%, what's that? That would in result in essentially a one-time bump to revenues of approximately $250,000. And then the presumably from there, an increasing amount similar to what they increase yearly now, um, based on just cost increases on, you know, hotel, you know, rates and stuff that go up yearly. But, but the, the, if the Municipal Empowerment Act was enacted, we'd see our revenues essentially go up about 250000 once and then a, a small that that would stay throughout um so all i've got is those screenshots so i can't manipulate any of those numbers or anything but since i had them i thought i could share them so that people could see them um i uh, if people have questions on that i'm happy to you know maybe we can answer some questions but i i, I have a number of comments i would like to make um related to the budget process um, and the frustration I've had with the decision 
and the recommendation the finance committee needs to make. And it's not a frustration with the finance committee. And I wanna say, it's not a frustration. I see we have some school committee members. It's not a frustration with the level of information you've provided us. I am frustrated with our town manager and the information we've not been receiving from him despite questions. We've been trying to receive information about what our options are and what the town staff's thoughts or pros and cons on those options are. I know I'm not the only person that sent questions to the town manager regarding some of the options we think might be there and what his thoughts are, or can he give us some pros and cons, but I've also sent a lot of questions regarding how legally any recommendation we might make works at the council level. This includes if the manager does not work with us, what legally the council can do under MGL. And I believe what we can legally do is if we look at page 292 in the budget book that has the financial orders, the only thing we can do is raise the financial order 2502 line in the column raise and appropriate the first green column on the left by the 355 and legally under the state law that we just adopted decrease some other line item in that column not in any other column in a different financial order by 355 that is very hamstringing because you look at what those columns are, retirement assessment, we probably can't do that actually legally without creating more problems for the town. Debt service, we probably can't do that. It's probably not a true option in that line uh, because we'd default on debt if we didn't appropriate enough money there. And so there's very few line items in there. But the other thing is they're in two different financial orders. And I've not been able to get any response from our town staff as to how we would legally potentially increase a raise an appropriate number in a financial order 2502 and have to, by law, decrease one in a different financial order, either 2505 or 25, 2505A or 2504. Do we have to do it in the same vote with the same motion? We normally vote these all different motions. Um, I haven't been able to get any response from that. If we wanna use ARPA funds, how do we actually do that in a way that legally does that because it doesn't show up in any of these raise and appropriate numbers? And so how do we adopt a 6% budget if we, the council, aren't adopting or voting on any use of ARPA funds at all with by, by getting to the regional school committee that, hey, we're actually going to adopt your budget and are we going to adopt your assessment method? I don't know, we don't have those answers. Paul, in fact, said we don't know yet when I asked him that on Tuesday. If we wanted to use free cash, we need a new financial order from Paul. Will he be willing to do that? Or would he resubmit a financial order under 2502, the regional school assessment that includes the use of free cash? We can't do that one on our own. We need his help and we haven't gotten any statement from Paul as to whether we'll get that help and whether if we need a new financial order or if we want to use ARPA funds, if he needs to submit a new budget, do we even have the time based on our schedule and the charter law about public hearings and public forums and timings for posting that to do it by June 30? And that in my mind, I, I am just so frustrated because we as a committee can't actually vote a recommendation without knowing whether whatever we want to do can be accomplished legally by June 30 and how to accomplish that. And so I feel like the lack of information from our town manager um, about those matters is prohibiting our committee from actually doing its job within the time frame we must do our job under the charter, which is by June 4th, vote a recommendation. And so I'm sorry to take so much time, but I think it's important for the rest of the committee to know my frustration and for the public and for the manager to hear that frustration, not just in an email at this point, but in public. Kathy? 
comments? <clears throat> You're muted, Kathy. Muted, Kathy. Mandy very clearly articulated um, what I was also going to say, so I want to build on it. I have separately, she said she've sent, I have separately sent what you just said, Andy, questions. The questions have been sent. We have, no, have had no answers. And you, Mandy, you looked at financial orders and gave out specific numbers. I'm sure they're sitting here somewhere and I don't know what where they are. So I always get to them later. But um, as I understood it, when we briefly met on this on Tuesday, you know, one possible place, and then I was jumped on for it, is if we looked at the capital budget, which is at 10.5, and we real realistically say, what's under that budget, which might not be spent in 2025. So it wasn't a targeting, a non-worthy thing. So my example was the Jones Library Debt Service. And I picked that one out because a year ago, it was also in the capital budget. And Holly explained to us why we had a big surplus at the end of the year in, you know, act, because we didn't spend that money. We had expected to spend it and we hadn't spent it. So if we realistically think that whatever happens, we only need half of it, or we only need two thirds of it, or we only need 70% of it at a million point one, it would yield 350. So that was one of your examples, Mandy, that, that there is a separate order for capital. And we come into capital, not designating what, but we've looked at what underneath it. So we're not trying to kill a project. And it's not a next year, we wouldn't fund it. So, so that would be one possibility that we as a council, as I understand it, could legally do. Um, we could say we're we're going up in one section and down in another, and we're it's an exact balance. Um, and we don't have to specify where it would come from in the capital budget, other than to understand there's a possible place it could come from that wouldn't undermine. And even if we come up with a repair thing, it's not going to be fully financed. Um, before half a year has gone by. And this that was a 12-month estimate on a $15.8 million debt service. Um, so unless you do that on day one, you don't incur that money. Um, as Sandy carefully moved some really big projects into the next year that we voted on this year. So we didn't see anything in this year's budget. So we, we need an answer on that. And the use of ARPA funds, that may be completely at the town manager's discretion. But I think getting a, a better feeling for where it might come from also leaves us on um, better financially financial confidence line. And I just want to point out that the million dollars of solar, unless Congress overnight gets rid of the credits, gets us back $300,000 with the 30% credit, and I went and I looked at the kilowatt hours that Crocker Farm uses. We could likely have enough solar on additional solar to offset the electric costs at Crocker. There might be a little bit left over. So we would be financing the electric, all of the energy mm -hmm. costs, heat and everything. And so it would help us on the budget long-term. So to that to me is extremely wise investment. And he's told us that everything has to be obligated by the end of the year with a specific, and that could be specific. A couple of the other th big items on the list, it's not clear to me we'll have all the details on it so that changing some of those wouldn't undermine a, a project that we already know exactly what we wanna do. And there's one other potential source, but I think, I think we need, um, Bob drafted a report for us with, an option A, an option B, an option C kind of thing. We we can't we can't easily decide where to go with about a better sense of consequences and um, what do we give up by that? So so I I'm prepared to make a motion on where to take it, <laughs> but I'd like it. I'm not sure I get other people on finance to go with me um, on it because we don't have enough information on our alternatives. So my last comment is I would really like, appreciate getting the information BCG 
received put in the finance packet. I think that's a useful thing because I think it leads us to this is a one time help on the regional budget. We we have a real we had a dilemma before the regional schools came in of saying, what does FY26 look like? And we may have to take a hard look at some other things that we committed to. And I can talk more about that later as we went through this budget review. Um, so um, so I, I think I'll stop there. And the, the very last thing is I really, I've been calculating budget costs for some of the new departments we added. Since we only see the salary costs, the real costs are about 30% higher, but I can't tell you the exact factor because we don't have health insurance and pensions. So we, we do have to be uh, financially accountable to the town as we look across this whole budget. So, so Mandy, I agree. I'm, I don't even know how to finish writing the report. Well, I mean, the rest of the sections can be descriptive, but the key part of it is this $355,000 um, and looking to FY26, you know, with a message. Um, okay, thanks, Kathy. Uh, Councilor Walker? <laughs> Um, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to express, I mean, most of the exact same concerns as both Mandy and Kathy just shared, so I won't go over them again. But I did want to add that I think we all are understanding the state of our financial future in Amherst and what limited wiggle room we have. And I don't think that that changes what our community values are and what we want to see happen within our schools. Um, and so I do think that this is going to take some carefully considering what our options are. And I know we've talked about not knowing what our options are and just picking one. Um, but I'm wondering in terms of like what our next steps for us as a finance committee, um, how we want to move forward with the report. Um, and I think we can list like we recommend X, Y, and Z options, but then does that put that, does that move those options to the council to then discuss? And does that just give us more time to get information um, because we don't have that information? Um, are we in a position where we need to say we need this information by this date or we make a different decision? Um, I think I would just like to get a better idea of in which direction this committee as a body would like to move. Um, and if we are all, in fact, thinking that we would like to recommend finding um, the additional uh, the additional monies within the budget, um, if that's something that we agree to as a committee, I think would be helpful for me to also understand. And I'm wondering if that is a conversation we can have now, and if not, when. Um, let me hear from uh, Andy and uh, Bridget and Holly. Andy. Yes, um, I guess uh, it's important that we have this discussion about how we would fund 6% and that we make sure that we get the questions out to uh, the town manager that will help us to comfortably make that decision if that's the decision that the council makes. Uh, and uh, so it is important that we have that part of the conversation, but I don't think we can lose the importance of conveying to the council that as a finance committee that we have joined with BCG and looked at the long-term problem and it needs a resolution. And there was one other aspect of the BCG meeting that I forgot to report and Mandy didn't report either. And that was that there was some discussion about whether or not uh, we are being too cautious in our budgeting process. And we are in fact uh, building money each year um, that ends up going into our um, stabilization fund uh, through free cash because of excess free cash at the end of each year and whether we should just we should just uh, be more um, aggressive well we can't be more aggressive in and put a balanced budget out but uh, one of the things that um, I remembered after the meeting 
was that when Holly provided, and I'm glad that Holly is here and has her hand up because when Holly provided in October the FY23 year end report, she did an explanation and provided a chart about um, the amount of uh, excess that was available at the end of each year. And um, she pointed out that because of COVID, we've been running an anomaly. Normally, and I've, uh, you, you, all of you know how long I've been involved in uh, town budget process. We have generally been ending years with 2% um, that has been returned. Um, and that is uh, the 2% excess of um, the uh, end result over the budget. Um, in other words, a surplus of the budget as opposed to a deficit of the budget, which is what you desire to do in a well-run organization. You always come out a little bit ahead of where you projected to be because you don't want to be a little bit below where you're projected to be and end up in a deficit situation, having operated uh, with an inadequate uh, planned budget. Uh, it has been higher in recent years, but her uh, report very clearly explains why there was a one-time bump in one year that was due to the close out of the health claims trust fund and the remainder of the years were due to um, COVID related budgeting, which is both cautious and uh, we were a little bit more cautious in budgeting because of the um, uncertainty of how COVID was going to affect the budget. And because we ended up with ARPA and other funds that enabled us to um, take care of some of the problems that we didn't anticipate. Federal government helped out all state and local governments in a whole big way that is ending, which is part of the school's problem and part of, part of our problem. So um, I don't think that um, the uh, hope that we could uh, be more aggressive in budgeting and therefore solve our problems that way is a real, real resolution. Uh, but that was an additional part of the uh, BCG discussion that um, Andy and I forgot to report. Bridget, do you want to make some yeah. comments? So I was, I was just going to say some of what Andy said because I felt like there were a couple pieces on BCG that didn't come forward. So one was what he talked about, but the other thing was um, that there was discussion. Sandy said he's using the most conservative guidelines and that you could use more flexible guidelines and they would look different. And so at some point, Mandy asked if maybe we could see those side by side. And then I think there was the discussion as well of if the way that we're doing it now um, ends up where we have too much free cash in the end point. But I think that he explained pretty well that you know, that's because of staff shortages currently. And so then that money gets really heavy at the end. But if we are aiming to have a full budget of what we've requested fully staffed, then, you know, then that's not really an area to dig into. But I wanted to also report that I left the meeting at 140, but it was reported back to me. So this is still second hand. But that from there on, most of the meeting was about a prop two and a half override for next year and what that would look like. And I just wanted to let folks know that that's a conversation that also came up at the regional school committee. So um, I think with the amount we're looking at for next year, especially if this is a one-time gift, I don't know there's anything um, that might fill it besides prop two and a half override. Thank you, Holly. Good morning. Um, I'm, th there are so many questions and I'm not going to pretend to know the answers to all of them, but I'm going to try to answer um, a few of them or, or clarify a few things. So 
number one, I don't think that the town man, I, and uh, again, this is my opinion. I don't think that the town manager intends to not fund the additional 2%. It's a matter of where and how we're going to fund the additional 2%. There are a lot of different options. Some of them have been discussed or many of them been discussed. There's probably other options as well, but I believe at this point, the, the sort of top three options are number one, ARPA funds, number two, free cash, or number three, making a change to the current budget and reducing somewhere else in order to fund the additional regional school district money um, in the operating budget. So I believe those are sort of the top three options. Um, they all come with their own challenges. I'm not gonna, you know, again, it, it's very difficult for me to sort of understand the, 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 the opinions and political um, sides of all that, but they all can be accomplished, I suspect, I assume and I'm hopeful by June 30th. It's just a matter of which option the town decides to go with um, through the finance committee, the town council and the town manager, which is picked as the, the preferred option. So if ARPA funds are used, there would be no additional appropriation orders needed. It would be a, grant agreement between the town of Amherst and the regional schools to pay some payroll expenses in an amount up to $355,440. Um, again, it wouldn't be an appropriation out of the town funds. It would be a grant agreement out of the ARPA funds. Free cash would be, again, an appropriation order that would need to be written if free cash were decided to be used. And then making a change to the current budget, reducing one area and increasing in another area would just be modifying the the draft appropriation orders that we have already, just making changes to one to increase it and making changes to another to, to decrease it. So th there's a lot of options. I don't know where the town manager is leaning for the number one option. I don't know where the finance committee is leaning towards the number one option. I don't know if you need feedback from the town council to figure out which you think is the preferred option. But I, I do want to just set people's mind at ease that I, I don't think there is any intention of not funding it. I think it's just a how do we fund it, which is the best, which is the quickest, which is the easiest, which is the, the preferred. And I think that that's sort of where we stand at this point. Um, there are um, other options I, that folks are talking about. Um, you know, in terms of the regional track and field request for that additional money and where is that going to come from and how are we going to do that? Can we combine these somehow? Can we take this out of, um, you know, capital and, and fund both of those things? Th those are all options. I think that there's just a, this has not happened before. This is not something we quite know how to deal with where we are definitely learning as we go through this process. Um, I certainly have never dealt with it before. I don't believe that the town manager has dealt with it before. You know, getting advice from legal counsel, um, getting information, um, you know, checking in with other cities and towns on how they've dealt with this and getting information from Sandy, it, it all just unfortunately takes time. So um, I just wanted, I just, wanted to say that and again this is this is my opinion of of how things um i don't want to speak for the town manager but this is my opinion of how things are are going to proceed thanks uh, paul the town manager can speak on this oh the paul is here now <laughs> paul do you want to weigh in i do i do and i i I'm, i think i got i got pretty much everything um uh, the, bulk, the bulk of uh, Manny Joe's and Kathy's and uh, Alicia's comments. So I appreciated all those things. Uh, I think Holly did say a lot of the things that I was going to say. Um, I think the threshold question is something that Alicia brought up, Councillor Walker brought up, which was, does the finance committee agree with putting in the additional 2% to the um, school regional school district budget or not? We have not heard from the finance committee on what you are recommending. If that's the case, my goal is to align my budget with the councils. There are two paths forward. One is I stick with the 4% for the regional school district. The council chooses if it wants to by two thirds vote to put in additional funds and then finds a way to reduce it. Um, I think I've said at the last meeting that I am inclined to 
find an additional 2% for the school, for the regional school district. But I have heard from individual um, finance committee members, but not the finance committee. If the finance committee is making that suggestion or recommendation, uh, then, it's, then, and I'm in alignment with that, then we would find what is the best path forward to do that. And there are multiple paths. Holly laid out the, the three paths that we have looked at that we're, you know, we've talked about. Um, and e each one has its pluses and minuses. Some are, are simpler than others. Some have time constraints, others don't. So I think, I, and I don't think there's, um, I think we do have time to process through um, the, the proper um, way to do it. Um, but I guess I really do need to hear from the finance committee as to whether you are in alignment with this additional 2% or not. I mean, if, if, the, if the majority of the finance committee is not, then I would be hesitant to be putting forward a, a, a different financial order. Thanks, Paul. Bernie? Well, um, do I wanna give the uh, regional school? Because the elementary school budget's been done, balanced. Do I wanna give the regional school an additional 2%? No. Will I vote to do that? or support that? Yes, because the consequences of not doing that, I think, will only complicate matters and cause too much too much tumult. So, you know, I'm gonna put a Band-Aid on the situation. Um, how we Band-Aid it, we've got three choices. I'd throw out a fourth, which is stabilization fund, which is traditionally what stabilization funds are for. Um, so we can put a Band-Aid on. I'm very disturbed by the talk of an override, any consideration of it. We've pushed the capital reserves up by five to 10 to 10.5% because we're trying to avoid overrides on our capital projects. We just got an override for, in my opinion, an excessively expensive elementary school, but we just got an override. Overrides, property taxes are wealth tax. Our wealth has gone up because of inflation. Our income, on the other hand, has not necessarily gone up. So when you increase a wealth tax, you're in effect adding an income tax. My cost of living adjustment as a former state employee is $360 a year. That's it, period. And if you wanna go uh, check the Boston Herald's records, you can find out what I get for pension. Um, I think you have to be very, very careful about any consideration of an override, particularly if the school committee is unwilling to take a look at how its budget is structured and how the money is spent. The Mass Teachers Association has a handy dandy guide to Proposition 2.5 uh, overrides. And one of the cautions that the Mass Teachers Association puts out there is you don't want to fail the sore thumb test. And what's the sore thumb test? When we have a school budget that puts our cost per pupil at either 12, uh, the 12th or 16th highest in the state, clearly the highest of any of the towns around us, then by the MTA's measure, we failed the sore thumb test. So let's set aside the cost, uh, the, the talk about uh, overrides, and let's get down to the more difficult and harder task of looking at how we spend looking at where our money comes from and trying to make some adjustments and changes. Thanks. Thank you. Councilor Haneke. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate Paul saying he will work with us because it has been unclear to me for the last two months whether that would be the case. So to hear that that is the case, I think for me, the problem is and, and I will say over the course of the last two months, as I have think thought about this, I have changed some of my thinking. I would like to find a place to fund the additional 2% that the school committee is asking for, but it's where the rubber meets the road, right? Can the finance committee agree on one place to do it, or can the full council agree on one place to do it from? Because if five of us want to fund it, but my my preferred method is X and I won't do Y and someone else's preferred method is Y and they won't do X, maybe we can't get to agreement. And I think that's where my frustration has been coming from is because we haven't heard from the staff 
what the pros and cons of each are in terms of, you know, I, I just, you know, some of the questions, Paul's not going to be surprised. I've asked these of some him, him already, you know, what are the pros and cons of decreasing the OPEB line and doing it, you know, because I know if we do it under state law by decreasing a raise and appropriate line on this page 292 of the budget, one of the financial orders, as long as those motions are, as long as both financial orders are in the same motion, I think we can do it legally without risking any fights that we didn't do it legally. But my, I look at that, my options are OPEB and capital. But for, you know, I kind of know what the consequences of the OPEB line issue are. Uh, but the capital line, what I haven't heard is we all know there's this 1.2 million in the capital now for library spending. And we look at it, and as Kathy's said, it's probably not going to all be spent for the library next year. And so what's going to happen to it? What is the town's plan for that money? Is it to just have it sit there and not be spent and then continue on capital's a different beast so it just would sit there i guess the whole time i don't know it wouldn't end up in free cash probably um because it's an appropriated use um potentially um but but what happens with it if we don't modify that line and keep it there or is there a plan from staff to modify that line in the future to instead of having it as debt service for a library spend it on an actual library hvac project or is there a potential plan out there to use it for the track which is one question I've asked, right? But I, I need to know what those options are and what staff is thinking about that 1.2 before I could even consider um, the possibility, you know, or as I consider Kathy's possibility of reducing that capital line by 355 to fund the school because there is potentially money there. And I'm missing the information from the staff about their thoughts on what happens with that money. For free cash, great. We get a separate order or we get a modified, I guess it's financial order 2502, the regional budget assessment where there's a raise and appropriate and then there's a free cash spending. Um, if we modify any of these financial orders through the manager process, do we need to go with, do we need to follow the supplemental um, budget requirements of the charter, which require a public forum, and I think 10 days notice to hold that public forum. And so do we need to, on Monday's meeting or on the 17th, we, it, the 17th might be too late to receive that modified financial order if we have to hold a public hearing or a public forum that requires 10 days notice. Um, we might need those modifications on Monday. And the, the finance committee should know that now because then we should be voting today to recommend that on Monday, the manager produce the modified one so that we can get it referred. And that's where my frustration lies is, I'm not confident free cash or even art, you know, and so that's the free cash one. Do we even have the time given that we might need modified orders to do it? With ARPA, my question relies with, as we consider these options, um, I, I'm, I'm not quite willing to use the, the, the solar money to do this on a one-time basis, but maybe Kathy's suggestion of the youth empowerment money might be there. What are the other options or some of the stuff that might not, there was a lot of roads and sidewalk money at some point in it as that's what we'll do if we can't do any, maybe we could dedicate some of that to it. What are the options and where would it be? Because the finance committee has to come down with one potential recommendation. And then if it's ARPA money, what does the regional assessment FY20 F, financial order number 2501, the regional assessment method financial order, do we approve the 6% even though we're not appropriating it all because it's coming from some other one? So I don't know the logistics of does that risk us somewhere else in terms of what, what are our recommendations on each of the six financial orders we're being asked to make recommendations on? And we haven't gotten the advice from town staff as to if we do ARPA, this is what our recommendation needs to be on the assessment method order or on the budget um, assessment order, because we're voting recommendations on financial orders. Um, and, and we don't have that information. And some of that might need voted today. Others of it might need voted, do, everything needs voted Tuesday. And so, yes, I want to find the money but there's some things I don't want to find it from and some things I might be willing to find it from. And I don't know whether the other committee members agree with me on those, those issues. Kathy. Well, 
I have a suggestion to at least get one piece out of the way. Paul says he needs a vote from us on whether we're going to recommend that we go from 4% to 6%. So I make a motion that we recommend to the council that we go from a 4% increase to a 6% increase for the regional school budget. So if I, I can make that. It, Sorry. Thank you. No, and so if I can make it just as a simple motion, I, I'm willing to take advice, but that would be my, my simple motion because the next motion is what Mandy is asking for. And we recommend to the council that they ask the town manager to fund it. Do we, do we need to do that now? Um, or do we need to say in one of three ways, present options to us on Monday? Because uh, I know where I would go and Mandy's just laid out, she wouldn't go the same way. So I'm making a motion to just get the first step of this that it sounds like there's, um, I haven't heard anyone say no to 6%, but if we could vote on that piece, we would at least say, yes, we're going to 6%. And that at least changes one of the appropriation orders and then we figure out the other then we continue this discussion i don't know whether people are willing bob to move to that vote but if we could have that vote then we could go to this the second piece of it yeah i i, I concur but let's hear from andy and mandy joe and and paul so andy kathy's just put another thing on the table and I guess I am not in favor of taking a vote today. Um, and uh, I would rather have a better picture of how it would be funded and put it as a package uh, than to take a, a vote. I think that we uh, can indicate by our um, informal comments uh, and I think we probably already have that all of us are trying to figure a way to get the 6%. We want that to be the result, but I don't know that I really feel comfortable doing a part of a motion and not doing the entire piece and presenting an entire plan because I think that's what the finance committee ought to do. Uh, second thing that I wanted to comment on is that the mention was a little bit made about override and uh, Bernie's already spoken on the topic. I agree with what he said. I think we have one of the highest tax rates in the state. We have one of, it was certainly one of the highest tax rates around. We have a population that has a lot of retirees. I am very uncomfortable. I am not sure that it would uh, pass at all if we um, we're, we're not in a position to rush into it. If we tried to do a November override, we'd be sitting in an override vote at the time that people are getting their first tax notification of what they're going to be paying in additional taxes because of the debt exclusion override. So that um, I think it's therefore not good timing for um, doing, for rushing an override. Uh, and I think that to support, uh, you know, we, we really need to hear, uh, get more sense of where other towns are and that other towns would be uh, with us because if they're not willing to do overrides and solve the problem, then I'm not sure that in the long run that we should be doing an override to solve the problem. So I, I really am concerned about uh, the the override and i guess the the uh the other two things that we the other thing we talked about are, are what are the options um i am uh still feeling that um uh, maintaining the capital budget at the level that we've talked about um and proposed uh, is the right thing to do i've spoken about that at previous meetings and I have not changed my position that backlog and we're including our $15 million of roads backlog, the amount that uh, we need to create safe and uh, usable streets for all users, including kids riding the bicycles to school, which was the TSO meeting yesterday, in part yesterday, uh, I think is uh, something that we 
we just need to recognize that our streets and sidewalks are totally inadequate as well as our needs for a fire uh, station, our need for a DPW facility. So I can't go there. The one thing that I do think is something we should be looking at is getting, um, we don't have, except for the first quarter, our reports on what's happening with this year's budget. I think with the number of vacancies uh, that there could be a free cash option um, because at the end of this year, we may end up with one more year of significant free cash balance and, and uh, for, for the current year. And uh, we can advance the decision of what we want to do with that free cash balance uh, by uh, including that in the process now. So those are my additional time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh <clears throat> Sorry, Bob, I just have a quick point of order. Is there a motion on the floor? Yes, there is. There's a motion okay. and it has been seconded. So we're we're just discussing. Uh, Councilor Haneke? So yeah, I'm gonna keep my comments to the motion and I'm not sure I can support just a blanket motion because our job is to say how to do something, not that we want to do something. And, and that's always been my concern. Um, regarding this conversation is I, I actually think many of us or a majority of this committee and maybe a majority, I don't know whether it's a majority of the council, I, I haven't talked, are trying to find a way to fund it, but it's how to that maybe we can't reach consensus on and that changes the votes, right? And so um, I, I'm looking to, to, and so I can't say yes, fund it when I don't know what I'm funding it from, because what I'm funding it from changes whether I say yes, fund it. Um, and that's why I need the information from all of these potential options to know whether I can say yes, fund it that way, or whether that's a no-go for me. You know, I, I implied that maybe capital is a no-go for me. Andy has said capital is a no-go. I need more information to say whether capital is a no-go for me. Um, you know, right now I'm leaning free cash because to me it seems the clearest both um, essentially legally and potentially the least damaging to the current proposed budget that I, I will admit Paul proposed a budget that meets our financial guidelines. Any line we change in that budget means we're changing it away from the financial guidelines. Um, you know, it, especially if we're decreasing some lines, it we're 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 telling him those guidelines didn't quite matter. Um, and and by seeking this money, we're also saying that too. But I understand that. But decreasing other lines that he worked hard to stick to our financial guidelines. I'm not sure we should do. So I'm leaning free cash, but I need to know with that one that we have the time to do it by June 30. Um, and I just don't know legally how that works, especially if we don't get an order till June 17th, if we have to hold public forums on it, um, whether that can be done all legally under the charter in time to vote by June 30. Um, given the meetings we have. So I, I'm not sure I can support the motion on the floor as worded because it's not specific enough and it's too general. Paul, did you wanna weigh in? Yeah, <clears throat> two things. Um, A, the council has taken, has given itself the authority to override the town manager's budget, which it is, Mandy Joe is in compliance with the financial guidelines. You can make a motion, any councilor can make a motion to, by two-thirds vote, increase the budget as you decrease something else. And I, and I understand you're saying we would like more information on how we would do that. That's not the path I hope you take, because I think we, uh, if the, again, if the finance committee is saying um, we want, we, we would like to see an additional 2% going to the regional school district, then we will be able to come up with options, which, which Holly has laid out in general terms. Um, I would wonder if the maker of the motion would consider instead of saying a 6% increase in the budget would say an additional 2% increase in the budget as a, as a set, sort of a um, recognition that the 4% is the amount uh, that was in compliance with the financial guidelines, but that the council is making a, an effort in the man. And I would align with that 
or an additional 2% to the regional school district's budget. Um, it may be a matter of semantics, but I think that it provides some clarity in what actions are being taken by the council. In terms of timing, <clears throat> I, you know, I think that the, you know, the different pathways we have going forward, um, we, I have not charted out exactly the timing of, is whether a um, separate um, you know, uh, public forum has to be held or not. Um, but I, I sort of feel like we will, a lot of the options we can be, can be accommodated and we would have to review with legal, which we've already had the conversation a bit with about uh, ARPA, there doesn't need to be an action by the council. That's a town manager um, action. Um, but so I think my main point of talking about this mm -hmm. is um, seeing if that makes sense um, to folks, if it's to say an additional 2% versus moving straight to a 6% increase in the, in the regional school district budget. Kathy? I'm totally willing to amend that. So Paul, I'll, I'll, I'll say it again, um, as that we recommend to the council that they ask the town manager or they recommend that the town manager add an additional 2% for the regional school budget. And I am prepared, Mandy, to say, and that the additional expense be financed from free cash. And let me just, so if people, I'm willing to amend it to make it a, a two part piece. And let me just speak to that for a second and then I'll see whether the person who seconded it likes, uh, likes the new revision. The reason I think we could do that is I do think that we're gonna come in under on the capital budget because of the line I've spoken about. And if um, we went through, Andy went through Holly's memos that showed us why we had more free cash at the end of the year than expected. One year it was because we didn't spend an expected debt authorization. And so if we don't spend it, it's gonna show up as we didn't spend that amount of money and that will show up as free cash. So if we wanted to, we could replenish the amount from reserves. You know, So I'm thinking that ultimately we can put that money back in. The other, uh, to preserve the solar money, that's $300,000, that almost replenishes it. So we could replenish it. So I think the idea of, of reserves makes total sense. It's It doesn't take something away from another piece. And as long as a financial order could be written in a way, Paul, that also allows us to vote that money. Um, so if, if I'm willing to propose that two-part piece. And if you need it to be, we usually try to do a complicated motion that has two parts into two motions, but I'm willing to do it in and if people will bear with me for now. Um, so I don't know, Alicia uh, supported my original 6%, so that's changing it to an additional 2% and then adding and that we fund the additional cost from using free cash. So I have to just see whether Alicia is willing to I will accept those. Okay, so. so yes. Have, yes, so you will accept it? Yes. All right. Uh, any uh, any comments, Bernie? Well, my preference would have been to take it from ARPA money because it's one-time money and it wouldn't impact any of our, um, any of our reserves. Um, Taking it from free cash would be, um, I, I think, another uh, acceptable approach and probably more economical in terms of people's understanding of how budgets work and where the money's coming from, including it as a funding source uh, in the current in the current year's budget. Um, what I would hope is that the council could um, uh, accept that rather than try to go through the motions of, uh, you know, trying to override the budget and making changes here and there. Um, that could also get us into a situation where we don't have a budget by June 30th and we uh, end up going to a one twelfth budget, which is not a comfortable kind of thing to do. So um, in terms of, of Kathy's revised motion, I would support it. Uh, again, I'm not getting what I'd like, but it's a move forward. Andy? It, it's difficult because um, 
I think if this was a future meeting and I had all the and I have uh, received a um, additional quarterly report, which we can request from Holly to make sure that we have it before we vote, I think I would be more comfortable in saying, yep, we're there. Um, I think that we're there, but I don't know. And therefore I will have to vote no on this because I think that we're taking a vote on something that we is unnecessary at today's meeting. I think the message is loud and clear that we want to get to 6%. I don't see that there's any advantage in taking the vote now. And I think that we would be uh, in a better position to do so when we have the quarterly report and we know that um, the assumptions we're making are correct. Um, we only had the first quarter report from the last year. And I think that uh, we can, uh, there's more information that could be available. Um, Holly, when will that report be ready? Uh, I have the second quarter report ready. It can I can send it out. Um, the third quarter report is still in the process. I I don't have that one completed yet. I can probably have it completed by the end of next week for third quarter report. Okay. I can forward the second quarter report to um, the finance committee and post it on the website, and then we can um, put it on an, a future agenda. Okay. Right. Uh, Councilman Haneke, thank you, Holly. I guess I have a question for for Paul. Um, it's unfortunate we won't have the third quarter before next Tuesday um, because that's more information than a second quarter. But I am I'm thankful that we can get the second quarter by next by Tuesday the fourth when the council the committee is required to vote recommendations on the budget. But my question for Paul is. Do you need a vote today on this motion to start preparing the orders or how to do it, um, given what's been said at this meeting? Um, or could that vote wait till Tuesday when we can see so that it's a potentially um, stronger vote in terms of eyes and nays um, if we have more information by Tuesday and postpone the vote till Tuesday? Or do you need an actual vote today in order to do what sort of what you've indicated, which is you want some information so that your staff isn't working on five different ways, um, such that we could get them the information by Tuesday or or depending on what you determine on when things, what, what it would look like before we actually vote this motion to use free cash. Um, <laughs> Uh, am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think, um, uh, you know, I, I think I think every uh, finance committee member has weighed in. And if I could just clarify, there is no objection to an additional 2%. But I understand there's the caveat of uh, the intention of the finance committee would be to add 2% to the regional school district budget with the caveat for many members of depending where you take it from. Right. And I think that's if that's the if that's the sense I'm getting of the meeting, I'm okay with the sense, but I do know that you have a motion on the table. Yeah, we do have a motion on the table, but that I think that is the sense of the committee uh, that that we 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 definitely want to go to the the additional two percent, but I I think we're we're torn as to where it comes from, where that money comes from, uh, and how certain certain we want to be about free cash, uh, Councilman. Mm -hmm. Hanke? Yeah, I guess then I, I'd like to either potentially ask a withdrawal of the motion itself or postpone. I'm not ready to make a motion to postpone the motion on consideration of the motion because uh, I'm still thinking through things because it, I, and I guess the next question is, you know, I, I take Bernie's thoughts seriously about ARPA, but I'd like to hear maybe more from Paul. And I don't know whether he's willing, he's ready to do that now about what the other options beyond solar are for ARPA money, the use of ARPA money. And then I'd really like to know how that looks in terms of the 
the votes that the council has to take on the three financial or particularly the two financial orders on the region budget, particularly the assessment method and the um, the assessment amount, because we'd be voting numbers that don't agree. Like if we vote the assessment method, we're not taking a vote on a full appropriation to comply with it. So I, 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 that's my concern about using ARPA money in a sense is which part of ARPA is it coming from, but also sort of the legality and logistics of essentially potentially approving two orders that don't agree with each other. Um, and, and how does that potentially hamper the town or the region itself when the town hasn't actually appropriated money under the assessment method? It just approved. Um, and, and maybe it's worth, instead of binding us to free cash today with a vote on a motion, getting more information to, to go forward on Tuesday, because maybe we'd change which portion we do as I think out loud. If I can respond, I think that's precisely the things that we are looking at, uh, Mandy Joe, in terms of meeting the requirements of the region, in terms of voting the budget. Um, whether ARPA meets that requirement or not. It certainly meets the finances that were requested by the Regional School District Committee. Um, but there are other ways we can handle ARPA that can also support this that we've looked at as well in terms of um, how we allocate the funds. So um, as, as Holly said, we've not gone down this path before. The council's never, um, you know, we've never moved above um, the recommended amount. So it's really uncharted territory for the town. I, you know, we always have concerns, serious concern about funding and operating budget with one time money. Um, and, you know, I think that our presentation to the bond rating agencies and their analysis of us, which um, I sort of summarize, mm -hmm. is that we do, we have abided by very strong financial guidelines, but I do recognize, I said, said this many weeks ago, that this is an unusual circumstance with the, with the regional school district. And I think um, moving this direction is the best move for this for FY25. But I do. But you, Ray, the, the finance committee members also raised the longer term challenges that are facing um, the regional school district and how that's going to be addressed. Um, because while this might solve FY25, there's a looming bigger problem in FY26, and um, there has to be a discussion about what that looks like. Um, for the, fine, for the entire town's finances, not to tell how the money is spent, but to say how much money is available to be spent. Kathy? Uh, so I, Paul, um, I just want to amend one of, the, one of the words you use. I think there is full support for the additional 2%. It's not dependent on which way we do. I think we've identified two preferred ways of financing it. One is ARPA and one is free cash. And we'd like to know more of it. It's not a if, it's yes. You know, just so you understand that it's a yes on the two. And then the is needing more information to make a decision. So Mandy, you're suggesting I wait. Um, my, my, I'm not anxious about the third quarter report because as I said, I think there's going to be that money and there's reserves, but I'm only, I only, I put this out in the interest of time. We have to draft a report. It's not just that we have to take a vote on Tuesday. And, you know, I think the current version of the report needs to start in a whole different way. And that would be easy on, you know, the current budget, but long-term budget, you know, on what we're looking at and particularly one sector. So we just raise that as this is, we may be solving a 2025 issue, but we can just start with that very strong message to everyone, the council. But so I guess no, I'm, I'm hearing, I mean, I wouldn't mind taking a vote today, but I'm hearing there's going to be uh, one, maybe two no's because they need more information and they don't want to take a vote now. Um, there's a slight preference for ARPA, but not a strong preference. And I just would like to send a signal. That's why I separated them, that the Finance Committee is going to recommend an additional 2%. So, um, so since no one wanted me to do that one without the other part, I'm caught in this quandary, like tabling it until 
uh, Tuesday feels like we never actually voted on it. So Bob, you're, you, you can advise me on whether we call the question and we move for a vote on this, knowing that anyone who votes no is not necessarily against it. They're just against making a decision on where the money's coming from. And no one wants me to have it in two parts. So I'm in this, <laughs> I'm willing to, I'm willing to separate them. 2% and the money comes from the following and I have people say not ready to vote on that. So any guidance, but that was my goal just to come out of this, not leaving it mushy. Um, we, we This has been before us for multiple weeks now. And I've looked at the numbers more than once. And I know all the other ARPA, it's not just the youth center, Mandy, there's a huge chunk for bangs, which had so little underneath it at the point we were seeing it and would have to be fully flushed out before December. So I don't know about that one either. You know, so there's money. Um, so, so that's just what I, I, I don't want to have the vote go down when everyone's in favor of the two percent, and I'm ready to vote for my own motion with a yes. So anyone can tell me what they would prefer. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get to yes here. That's what Haneke. So, I guess if the committee still wants to consider the use of ARPA funds, then if we vote today on the motion as worded, there's no consideration of ARPA funds anymore because of how it's worded. And I think that's that's what we as a committee have to determine and whether a vote to use free cash is 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 something, whether we want to sort of preclude consideration of ARPA funds or whether we'd still like to consider ARPA funds. Um, or, you know, I, I hate hesitate to even change this motion wording again, but could it be in a absolutely you know, the two percent with the intention to use either free cash or ARPA funds pending more information or something like that that would 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 signal what I feel like I, I'm hearing from Kathy and, and Councillor Walker uh, a desire to signal um, and so, I, I, if Paul wants that signaling, I want to signal it. But but I'm hearing from myself. I'm I'm saying myself. I'm still trying to figure it out. But I'm also hearing from Andy Steinberg that that, and and even from Bernie that there we don't necessarily want to preclude ARPA consideration right now. And so I, would I be don't happy know whether the best best method is to yet again try and do a modification of the motion so it it considers both, or whether we should just table the motion till Tuesday and deal with I'd be it happy to, or all. I'd be happy to amend it, Mandy. I, I was thinking the same way. It, it's either free cash or ARPA, you know, with that to be determined, you know, next week. Um, I'm happy to amend it to say free cash or ARPA. Uh, Councilman Walker, is that acceptable to you? Uh, we can't, we, you're, you're on mute. We may have lost her. Well, I can see if I've got someone else to second. And I see Bernie's hand is up. Sorry, oh. yes. Okay, thank you. Bernie? <laughs> Bernie, you're on mute. <laughs> I thought I clicked a little button, but I guess I didn't. Um, I'd just like to make the point that we're not telling Paul what to do, we're making a suggestion to the manager. Um, so if we suggest we'd like to have this 2% and we'd support it and we suggest it comes from uh, free cash, then, and he comes back and says, well, you know, I can meet the first part of your suggestion, but not the second, uh, that's another story. So we just wanna keep our, our, uh, our, our lines of authority clear here. Um, the other thing is, is that how much, um, Holly, can you say how much free cash we have on hand right now? Just give me one moment and I can find that for you. Hang on. Yeah, because we're not, we're not, you know, spending free cash we're accumulating this fiscal year. We're spending free cash that we accumulated last fiscal year. Correct. Free cash is only certified um, 
in the fall time and I just have to double check everything that came out of it, make sure that we have it. And then on okay, June 30th, you, you, that have, you have some confidence, you have some confidence that there's 355,000. Oh yes, there most definitely is. Yes. Okay. That's, that's <laughs> close yeah. enough for, for this <laughs> work, I guess. Um, so, so I, again, I don't know that we need to, I think if Paul is looking for a sense of the committee, then he's certainly got that uh, the two percent add-on for this year is okay. Um, our we've identified two sources of funding where we prefer it come from. Now we're, we're basically handing this back to him and saying, okay, we've we've set these limits that we we're telling you what we like. We're we're not telling you what you have to do because you're the manager, but we're telling you what the sense of this committee is. Councilor Walker. <clears throat> Um, hi, sorry. Yes, I do actually have to leave the meeting now. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that this was the direction we're moving in, because if we were going to vote, I wanted to be able to vote, but um, I do have to leave. Okay. Kathy, do you want to, do you still want to, a vote on yes. your... Yeah, I would like a vote. I would like a vote on the motion and I can read it to the extent my messy handwriting has it in double notes is I make a motion that we re recommend to the town council to recommend that the town manager add an additional 2% for the regional school budget and that the additional expense be funded either by free cash or from ARPA to be, to be determined later. Okay. And uh, Alicia, that's our Councilor Walker. That's acceptable. Yes. Okay. Uh, then we should vote. Um, Councilor Haneke. I'll vote aye on that one. Andy. I'll go with aye. Uh, Kathy. Yes. Uh, Councilor Walker. Yes. Bernie? I support. And I'm an I. So it's uh it's unanimous. Thank you, everyone. Um so let's just quickly go through the um the 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 draft committee report. I I'm I'm looking for I know um I talked to uh, Alicia about her section, said she's planning to get it to me tomorrow. Uh, Bernie, what, uh, how are you doing on your sections? When can I expect to see it? You, you should expect it on Sunday. Okay. <laughs> uh, Andy, are you going to write up something for police, or do you want me to write up write up police? I was going to try and write up something on police, though I uh, may not get to it till the weekend for the say, because I, as you heard earlier I have to do a TSO report yeah is a higher priority okay All uh, right. but but it isn't that long a section on the police no. and uh, uh, so I don't think it's going to be a complicated issue my other comment on the report is is that I really think that we need to get for the committee discussion um the draft on what we're um uh, where we are with regional schools because i think that um you know our recommendation is now clear as far as the bottom line of an increase for fy25 um and for in, in a methodology to be determined later but the piece about um our concerns about 26 and beyond, and um, our um, expectations um, and recommendations of what the council might want to say um, on um, a process going forward so that we get that addressed in a positive way, I think should be in our report. So we need to go work on that. Yeah. I. Uh... Kathy, you and I can work on that. Um, I, I can certainly work on it um, tomorrow if, if that works for you, Kathy. Okay. Uh, Councilor Haneke, you have a comment? Yeah. Um, 
And, and and I'll probably try sending you some thoughts on this, but I wanted to put it out there now. Um, I, I think, and, and it might be my section that I have to redraft the overall budget section as I think about this, is, is, is sort of a summary of just sort of what we've heard from all the departments regarding the budget, you know, in terms of staffing, in terms of, you know, just a, from the municipal side, it's a very tight budget that is not permitting X, Y, and Z, and, and staffing is an issue across all budget areas, both maintaining staff levels that are budgeted, but also many departments want staffing. And so I think I might take a re-look at um, my the overall budget section, which was sort of my section about does it meet the financial guidelines and all, to, to talk a little bit more about the challenges that we have heard from just the, the sort of all challenges, you know, that that were across departments, sort of not just one mm -hmm. department has this small thing, but but those trends that we heard across all departments in terms of their challenges, um, and and find a way to sort of make that front and center too. This report, I, I guess, I'm concerned. Also, it's very helpful, but it's also going to be over twenty some pages long. So I'd like to find a way to highlight parts that we really want to highlight. Um, and I don't know whether that's adding an executive summary that includes some of this or something, but but if someone just wants the the guts of it of does the budget meet the guidelines, what are the overarching challenges and what are our recommendations and the motions that need made, can we get that to them in, you know, like one page at the very front somehow? Um, <laughs> I don't know if we can get it in one page, but um, we could certainly do an executive summary. Uh, the other thing that uh, I have found is very helpful is to put in little call out boxes like here's here's like the major message for this this department or something like that. Um, we can we can think about adding those. Um, so, Kathy. Um, so I think Holly had her hand up briefly, probably to give us the answer on free cash. Was that what you were doing, Holly? And But then I do have a comment. I certainly can give you that answer if you like. Um, we have, uh, we still have $4.6 million in free cash. So so my, my comment was going to echo Mandy's. I actually, I mean, others like to tell stories from their past. So I'll just tell you one quick one. I worked for a secretary of health at one point who, when we came in with a long report, he said, this is what I'm doing with your report. And he threw it in the trash can. And he said, you come back and you tell me in one page cover, what's the most important thing for me to know and where to go to find out more. Um, I mean, he I, I just think we need to do that. And um, in terms of stronger messages, that's part of the place we can say, um, the out years don't look good. You know, so the same as Mandy said, you know, we've got a staffing crunch across even retaining people is a challenge, um, much less thing. And there are a couple other things that we can decide whether we want to highlight them and then quickly go to the regional budget as, as a core thing. So we, we can try to get it into one, Bob. And the only way I've ever found to get things into one is use bullets, you know, to try to avoid long paragraphs, you know, to the following things, but, but I'm, I'm available um, to try to do that. And just so people know the the draft that Bob sent out earlier today has two sections I drafted on regional and elementary. And one of the things I did was go back and look at enrollment and staffing back to 2010 because I just wanted to see uh, with no commentary and I had to go to two different sources for it because it's easy to find enrollment in DESE. It, I had to go to staffing reports. So I included tables for both of them um, to, and, and the regional talks a lot about FY26, but I was waiting for this discussion to finish it. So it's a draft on it. Therefore we recommend <laughs> it's got, question marks, um, but I can round that out because we just heard the three options for funding today. So so those, Bob, I'll just amend, but I didn't know whether people had a chance to even see that there are two pieces in there on the schools. 
Yeah, I did. I'll, I'll send out. I know I, I modified the crests right up based on your comments, Kathy. So uh, let me send out a, a, a new version, which has today's date on it. I'll send that out to everybody um, right after this uh, meeting. And then I think the intent would be we we get a report that has an executive summary and it has some of the highlights on it and at least reflects what we just did today on this uh, reg regional piece with this open-ended, where's the money coming from? Mm -hmm. Well, open-ended, but down to two sources rather than could come from anywhere. Okay, Great. all right. Well, um, is there a motion to adjourn? No moved. Second? I'll second it. <laughs> uh, Councilor Haneke. Aye. I'm an aye. Andy? Aye. Kathy? Yes. Bernie? Bye. Okay. Thanks, everyone. We're adjourned then. Thanks very much.